have 15 minutes to talk to you about a topic that usually takes university students half a year to grasp, um, and that's computer graphics basics. But hey, virtual reality is cool, so let's talk about it real quick. Um, <laughs> and the clicker's not clicking. That's not a problem. I have a keyboard. Oh, you're my clicker now. Awesome. So um, when it comes to creating web content in 3D, the thing is that you have to deal with very different things that you're usually dealing with. You have a bit of DOM, a bit of JavaScript, a bit of CSS. Hurrah, there's your web application. However, in 3D and graphics, things are slightly different. So one of the biggest problems of getting started with that is there's a lot of lingo, a lot of terminology that you have to get behind. And uh, this is an excerpt from an actual tutorial for beginners. And it reads, obviously, it's not the start of it, but still, it reads, this is passed to the shader and used to calculate lighting for the object. Uh, OK, I think I get what's possibly, I would have to research what a shader is, but OK, lighting for the object, I get lighting. OK, I understand. Uh, it is the transpose of the inverse of the upper left 3 by 3 submatrix of this object's model view matrix, right? Obviously. Um, so I'd rather not click. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you're doing a good job. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'll just, I'll just do it. Um, the, the thing is, in, in no worky. Um, so I'm, I'm saying we don't do that. Thank you very much. Um, instead, we are doing the following thing. Click. <laughs> it's good that it paces me. Should I? Yeah, click. Yeah, do. Oh, I, ah, right, OK, ah, you're watching that. Now I understand it. We are basically doing Morse code, because if I click here, it blinks there. <laughs> Future! Um, anyway, so, <laughs> so instead, we don't have time for that. Shh, shh, shh. Serious stuff. OK, um, so if we want to do graphics, we have to start with points. And because mathematicians are very pedantic people, they're like, no, 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 those are not generic points. They are vertices, because that's where two line segments meet. And uh, so we call them vertices, but they are points of our shape. But points really don't make shapes until we connect them. So we connect them up to triangles. Why triangles? Well, I don't really want to teach a computer every single shape there is. So it turns out that triangles are kind of like the brute force method of graphics. If you use enough triangles, you can approximate pretty much every shape. So the convenience would be we only teach a computer to draw a triangle, and then I can make every shape appear. And then some clever people build hardware that actually figures out what kind of pixels we have to color in to make that shape look more than like a 90s like laser show kind of thing. So um, now we have a shape that we can color in. It's ready to color in. Then we write a program that's called a shader um, that actually determines the colors for each of these points. And how it does that is absolutely up to us, writing that program. Uh, we can use like a, a, a normal color. We can make everything like green, for instance, or we can say make it a gradient, or we can use, like we can read pixels and colors from an image and put that onto the triangle. We can do that, and then we get a triangle that looks like something like this, for instance. Great, so that's 3D graphics. But if I look at that abstraction level, I'm like, I don't really know how to build applications with that, right? So I'd like to introduce a little higher, uh, a higher level application or abstraction, sorry, a higher level abstraction uh, to work with. And so, for instance, think about making a movie. One thing that you need to make a movie or a theater play, for that matter, is you need a stage. You need a scene where things happen. OK, sure. Then you need some props and actors to actually go onto that stage and make something happen, because an empty stage is not very fun to watch, right? So here we are putting some meshes. That's the lingo that the 3D people use. We are putting some meshes, which are 3D objects made from triangles connected to faces and then shaded. Um, we put those onto the scene, and then we have something that we can possibly film using a camera. The camera is only a conceptual thing, like where am I, from where am I looking onto the scene? And like, because different, like, I, I see the scene differently than you guys see the scene, because we have different angles from which we are coming. So the camera basically encapsulates that. And once we have the camera, the camera would film onto a film or an SD card or something. Uh, we are not doing that. We are putting it in the web. And the web means there's a canvas element that is really good for pixel access, and it gives us access to a technology called WebGL. So there's a WebGL API that is really good at putting pixels onto a rectangular area into your website, and that's the renderer. 
We could theoretically render with something else. We could use SVG or CSS or something, but we are using WebGL because it's really fast and really optimized for 3D graphics. And then we have our content on every device that has a browser that supports it, and that's pretty much every browser out there because this technology is around since 2011, works on IE11, works on Edge, works on Samsung Internet, works on um, what's the thing with the Doga uh, servo. So yeah, all these things basically support it. iOS, all good, nice, sweet. This is the code that you would have to write to do that in vanilla WebGL. Don't read that code. We don't have time for that. It's terrible. Don't do it. Luckily, there's libraries like 3JS that abstract this away into the application or uh, abstraction layer that I've just been talking about. It's like making a movie. And here we have like a scene, we have a camera, we have a renderer, and we have a box, which is a mesh. We put the box onto the scene, and then we have a render loop that runs all over again and basically just films the scene via the camera and puts it onto the canvas using the renderer. OK, that's better, I think. But if you look into it, we're not only putting one thing on screen most of the time. So let's, have, let's do a little thought experiment here. So what if I have a ship that has a captain, and I want to move around the ship, then I have to move around the captain as well. That's a bit tedious. So how about we make that captain 3D model a child of the ship model? And if I move around the ship, the captain kind of moves with it. And then maybe there's something else on the ship as well. Maybe there's a table. And on the table, there is um, a coffee mug and maybe some binoculars and a map. And if I move the table on the ship, the ship doesn't move, the captain doesn't move, but the table moves. And with it, hopefully, the coffee mug and the binoculars and the map and all that kind of stuff. So we have to build a tree. But that's cool, because we as web people are like really good at building trees. So uh, we're like, yeah, this is some stuff that I know. Who here knows the Dom tree, huh? And I now know who's like, what is he talking about? I just checked my emails. Um, that's perfectly fine. It's going to be more visual in a second. So I thought, uh, well, actually, not only I thought, we as, at Archaeologic, which is the company that I work at, thought we want to make 3D content on the web and VR content on the web easier for everyone. How can we make that easier? Because right now, you have to like, write a lot of JavaScript, and uh, it's tedious and boring. And, uh. So how about we have some declarative way of creating 3D content? And that looks, to me, as a web developer, that looks much, much nicer to work with. I have a scene, and in the scene, I nest my elements. I have my, my uh, camera that has attributes like position and rotation, and I can just rotate things around things. And I don't have to deal with radians. I just use uh, degrees like every human being does. Um, and then here we have a mesh. OK, there's a bit of implementation detail. I want to be able to, to specify the geometry, which is like the points and vertices and all that kind of stuff, you know? Um, and the material, like color and how reflective it is and all that kind of stuff. I want to be able to, to manipulate that uh, manually. I also want to load like 3D models and all that kind of stuff. So this is the API that we dreamt of. And uh, when that came up in our work, uh, I said, Polymer is the thing. So I build it with Polymer, and now comes a live demo. And I hope that you're all with me and have all your you know, fingers and toes and all that kind of stuff crossed, because it's going to blow up big time. Right, here we go. Um, so here we have a scene that hopefully is large enough to read. If not, tough luck. Um, so here we are seeing like we have a, a three scene. And in the scene, we have a camera and the mesh. And in the mesh, we have the geometry and material. So what happens if I say, for instance, I want to change the material. I want to change the color from green to red. And I do that, and et voila, my box is now red. To be honest, this is a little super boring. Thank you. Shh. We don't have time for that. Um, so uh, that's, that's cool and nice and fine and all. And I can make like, you know, I, I'm a kid of the 90s, so I go like, ooh, wireframes. Um, and I make that green again, because you know, green is awesome for wireframes. So yay, green box. And, uh, and what about I can change this to, let's say, a sphere? Oh, that doesn't look like a sphere. That's a sphere. Well, that is because of the parameters here are saying how many triangles it uses. The first one is the, is the radius, so I can make that larger, for instance. But then I use one triangle <laughs> for each of the sides, and it's, like, it's not very good. So how about we use like 16 triangles, and hey, a sphere appears. So shh, we're not there yet. Jesus, you are easy to impress. And, um, I'll just remove that and pull out the most dangerous thing ever. I load 
from the network. <laughs> yeah, that's going to go well. Um, so there's a 3D format called GLTF. I, it's like GL transfer format, but I'm like, it's called WebGL. It should be WTF, right? Uh, anyway, so now it's like GLTF. That's what we got. I have a few really cool people that I work with. And um, one of them is Madalena Kalender, who's probably watching the live stream right now. And uh, she made me a 3D model, because on Twitter, two days ago, someone was like, could you? I, I showed a GIF of that demo, and he's like, could you do it with a like, Polymer logo? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, hi, Matt Lina. I know that you can do Blender and 3D modeling, and I can't, so please. And she, she said, yes. So we have a 3D model. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it an ID as well, just so that I can access it later on. And I position it into the screen so that we see it uh, minus five meters into the screen. And, um, and that should pretty much be it. And there we go, a 3D model of, of that. And because, shh, we don't have time for that. So. Um, because this is a DOM API, I can totally go and say, hey, 3Scene, can you give me an update whenever you are rendering something? So whenever you render a frame, please call this function and do something. And um, I'll, I'll take a, I know var is out and boring, but screw you all. No, not logo. Uh, I want an angle. And um, what I can then do is I can say logo rotation equals template strings. Hurrah, because template strings are awesome. And um, I want to rotate it around the y-axis. So if this is my y-axis, I want to rotate it like that. And I use plus plus angle. So on each frame, I increase the angle by one degree. And there we go. That was easy. Now you can clap. OK. <laughs> Woo, OK. Ta-da. Um, this is kind of like my, my two-sided slide. If it would have failed, I would go, sorry, I, I didn't know. That was a picture where I was young and pretty, and now I'm just old and the opposite of pretty. Anyway, um, so moving swiftly on, <laughs> let's talk about VR. <laughs> All right, uh, so the native VR experience, if you want to call it an experience, is you start by like Googling for something, and then you download it, and then probably Windows has to make an update or something, and then you install it, and then it like, probably crashes your computer or reboots your computer because it's Windows. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so basically, you have to download it, you have to install it, and then you go into VR. And I find that bizarre, because that feels like back in the 90s. I'm like, yeah, I, I remember that, like sitting in front of my computer, waiting until like. ACD-ROM has basically vomited everything onto my hard disk, and then I could finally install it and then run it and have fun. But this is 2017, so I would like an experience where I open my browser and type in a URL, and then I put on my headset, and then we're done, right? Because it makes so much sense, and we are living in this future uh, thanks to a standard called WebVR. And WebVR basically gives us three things. First things first, it detects if there is VR hardware available. And that might as well be if you're on a phone and you have a Daydream or cardboard device, then it goes like, yeah, this thing can possibly be put in a cardboard device, for instance. And uh, it also gives you a bunch of parameters, like how do you have to distort everything and all that kind of stuff. So it gives you uh, this kind of information. And then it gives you information that you really need, because we're putting the user front and center into our application. Whenever the user's turning around their head, we have to take that interaction for like our camera. Our camera has to, act, uh, to move the same if I move around in the, in the room. I have to kind of like update my camera to move around in the room. So it gives us this kind of information as well, called the pose. Um, also, we have like hardware that is uh, additional controllers, like the, the Daydream controller, the Samsung Gear VR controller, um, HTC Vive has them, Oculus Rift has them. So you have controllers in VR space, and you want to have access to them as well. So the, the WebVR standard augments the GamePad API to actually provide you access to this information as well. And when you have all that, then you write a bunch of code. So here, for instance, we are asking for the displays. It resolves with a promise because it's a modern API. And um, it gives you a list of displays. Great. You want to grab and hold onto a reference of one of the displays, if you have one. Because then later on, when there's a user gesture, so the user has to explicitly say, I want to enter the VR mode now. So for instance, clicking a button or something. Um, then we can ask this display, hey, I would like to present what I have on this canvas over here. So you can have multiple like, scenes or canvases, and you can select which one you want to render. You don't have to use WebGL. WebVR and WebGL are two different things. It makes sense to use WebGL because you want to render a lot of stuff really fast, but you don't have to necessarily use that. You can't render DOM content, unfortunately, yet, but let's see what the future brings. 
Once we have that in our render loop, what we do is uh, we are basically asking for frame data, which means we are getting back like the position and orientation and all that kind of stuff. Then we are rendering two times, once for the left eye, once for the right eye. And when we have done that, we submit that information onto the, H, uh, like on the device that you have in front of your eyes. So we are sending this information over so that you, uh, the user actually sees it there. Uh, once we have done that, we are using the VR display request animation frame. Because for VR, we want at least, if we're like, doing proper VR, then we want at least 100 frames per second. Now you know that the request animation frame loop is usually like, locked at 60 frames per second at best, even though your hardware might do better. Um, so here we get the native refresh rate of the VR device. So we can basically deliver this information or the, the graphics as fast as the VR device can do it, not as fast as our browser can do it. That's an important difference. Even in 3JS, that's a little more complicated. So we thought, how about we're making this really easy? And all the change in the code that I showed you earlier on from our, our demo is I say, allow an, a, a VR mode automatically, which means like we are putting a button somewhere for you without you having to do anything uh, if there is a VR display. If not, then we are not showing that button. Uh, and then we have a VR controls, which gives us like where is the user looking at. And then we put our camera into it, which means that whenever the VR controls are updating, they are updating the position and rotation of the camera automatically for us. And that, I think, is amazing, because it's a tiny change to go from 3D content to VR content if you're doing it declaratively. You don't have to deal with any of the hairy uh, API things beforehand. And this is like how it looks like then. I'm sorry for the quality. It's a GIF, and uh, turns out GIFs are large. Surprise. Um, so it kind of like, you know, you, you see that it automatically like does the distortion and all that kind of stuff. So you don't have to worry about that at all. That's the, the Web VR API at play for you. However, the, um, <clears throat> the actual reality coming back from virtual reality is that it's not like that. And you're not going to find this project online. Because there is, uh, as it turns out, prior art. And um, there was Vermal in 1995, and it was like standardized in 1997, and it was XML based and pretty heavyweight and not really, never caught on really that much. You needed a plugin into the browser, and oh my God. But then browser vendors sat together in 2001 and said, hey, Xfreedom, yes, it's pronounced Xfreedom, uh, is an XML ex uh, extension for the browser that you don't have to like, install a plugin for. It still works in your browsers today, probably, um, and gives you also the possibility to like, declaratively create 3D content and VR content. But they're not very good. But then we found that in 2015, Mozilla put out A-Frame. It has a huge and vibrant and amazing community and like, beautiful, wonderful dev tools uh, support. It's really, really cool. It's really vibrant. It's the thing. And it's basically doing what we're doing, just better. So use that. <sighs> and, but the good news is this is a Polymer conference. So don't worry. Polymer and A-Frame play really well together thanks to the fact that they are platform-based. They are using the platform rather than fighting the platform. So here I'm having a color picker, and I'm binding the color attribute straight to the color attribute of my box. So that's all that it takes to do that, really. Um, so yeah, I learned a few lessons, and I'd like to share them with you at the end of my presentation. First things first, just because you can build a thing doesn't mean that you should really do it. Um, because if I would have done my research, I would have found A-Frame, and I would have saved like three days of working. On the other hand, working with Polymer is pretty amazing, because you get really good results really, really fast. Um, also, you know, don't really have to reinvent the wheel all the time. So I mean, I was like, OK, even if the A-Frame exists, we still have to wrap it for, you know, nah. and it turns out, no, that's not true. Because actually, Polymer is really friendly to integrate with things like this. They are all using platform APIs. They're using DOM events. They're using attributes. They're using uh, elements. It's, it's really easy to kind of like put them together and have fun. right? You don't have to like worry about it, that you have to wrap it into something. It's fine. And last but not least, use the freaking platform. Because we have it, and it's awesome. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much.